Uh, thank you for all, firstly, thank you for, for all of you coming today. Um, I appreciate you all taking your time out of your day to attend this presentation. Um, I know a few friendly faces in the audience already, and most of you uh, I don't. So for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Rob King, and I'm a web performance expert at the NCC Group. And so what that entails is my day-to-day -day role is typically meeting with clients and learning about their problems and, and ultimately trying to help them make their websites faster. So um, I've noticed more and more of our clients that I work with going on journeys with regards to HTTP. And primarily, that's the upgrading of HTTP 1.1 to HTTP 2. Uh, so, and for my own convenience, I'm going to be calling it H2, um, which is the recognized abbreviation for HTTP2, um, which is what I will be talking about today. So a brief history of HTTP. Uh, the first introduction of HTTP uh, officially came in the form of 0 0.9 in 1991. And back then, the, in the landscape of the web was very, very different to how it is now. Uh, primarily just the transferring of files. Um, there, there wasn't anything, anything like there is today. In 1995, there was HTTP 1.0 released. And the web was starting to take more of a familiar feel, as in there was uh, some text on, on a website. There might have been a couple of images as well. But still very, very early and very primitive. 1997, and HTTP 1.1 was released. And 1.1 primarily address, addressed the, the bugs and issues that were prevalent in 1.0. And then after 1.1 was released, we had a very, very long time with no releases whatsoever. And in that time, websites continued to get um, more rich in terms of presentation and more complex in terms of functionality as well. And while that's a great thing, the net effect of that in terms of speed and performance was that websites started to get slower. So in 2012, Speedy, which is a, a Google project, um, was released. And that attempted to address some of those issues, um, trying to speed things up on the web. And 2015, HTTP2 was released, which um, runs, uh, essentially uses the Speedy template to, again, deliver websites in, in a faster way. So the issue with slower websites is that, um, so can I just actually have a show of hands? So who's aware already, um, who, who's already aware that a slower website um, is going to have a lower conversion rate and make less revenue? Who's aware of that already? Great, OK. Um, who, who isn't aware of that already? OK, great. So exactly, so a faster website, more money. And that's why businesses care about it. They want to increase their conversion rate. And so with HTTP 1.1, as web developers, we really try to make it work. Um, we used lots of hacks and techniques to try and get the most performance out of HTTP. Uh, we did things like domain sharding. So we'd spread our content across multiple different domains um, in order to open up extra parallel connections within a browser. So most major modern day browsers, they support up to six concurrent connections um, per domain. And so opening up additional, uh, doing domain sharding would open up additional connections across, across um, concurrently across that browser. And we did things like image spriting, where we would uh, sprite images together. We'd put images together so to create one large image. And then so that was then one TCP connection. Uh, to then download that image. Um, it didn't require those additional round trips of downloading additional images. Uh, we did things like concatenation, where we'd merge JavaScript files together, merge CSS files together, to, again, to create that one large file. Um, so we don't have that additional, we didn't have those additional connections to download that. And for the most part, these experiments worked. They did make our websites faster, but they weren't without their, their faults, and they did have issues. HTTP 1.1 even introduced pipelining, which again was an attempt to speed things up. Speed things up. 
So the way pipelining works is it uh, allows over one TCP connection, the server, um, the client and the server to send multiple requests um, without having to wait for the prior response to return. Uh, so um, yes, yeah, so multiple requests without needing that first response. And there was stipulations with that. Uh, the responses had to return in the same order that the requests were made. And also the responses had to return in full. They couldn't return in partial chunks. And the issue with that was that it produced something called head of line blocking. And so head of line blocking is when there are lower priority resources blocking the downloading of higher priority resources. And essentially that produced a bad user experience for websites. Um, and in fact, head of um, pipelining actually had a net negative effect on speeding up websites. Uh, websites actually got slower using pipelining, which is why pipelining by default is turned off uh, in all major browsers, and it's unsupported by all major browsers as well. So what are our options? Can't we make better use of our bandwidth? Speedy, 2012. Uh, it, again, it became that template for HTTP2. And for those that are keen to learn more about Speedy and the history behind that, there's a, an array of information online to be able to research that. And then HTTP2 arrived in 2015. And for the most part, it's been a great success. On average, HTTP2 is faster than HTTP1. Akamai recently did a study, and it showed that responses on average are about 20 to 25% faster to download on H2 when compared to 1.1. And so every website's different. There's always going to be outliers and anomalies. And depending on it's how it's implemented, but for most websites, H2, HTTP2, H2 uh, is faster. So from a high level perspective, the, nothing fundamentally changes. Um, so, so implementing H2, there's, it's not going to require any development work, any changes to the code base. Uh, the only difference with H2 is the way the data is transferred across the pipe, uh, across the wire. So it's essentially, it's, it's the same protocol um, when comparing 1.1 to 2. It's still a request response based protocol, um, which is, is great. It's easy to implement. There's, um, there's no development cost. And so a little bit more granular, how TCP, um, how H2 works in comparison to 1.1 from a TCP connection level. We can see on the top uh, 1.1, and so it's one TCP connection per object that's being downloaded, and that request respon repon uh, response type setup. And then H2 uh, on the bottom, uh, hopefully you can all see that, that's um, it's showing one TCP connection, and the data is then sent um, with streams and frames within those streams, and then it's multiplexed across the same TCP connection, which is, um, so it's one TCP connection per domain for H2, so it's a lot less TCP connections. And the way that it does that, as I mentioned, is multiplexing. So each request can be made immediately without waiting for the um, prior response to return. And the way that's different from pipelining is that the re responses don't have to be returned in full, and they don't have to be returned in the same order that the requests were made. So it completely bypasses that head of line blocking issue that we had with 1.1. And so the stream um, is a two-way flow containing one or more messages. And a message is essentially it's a request or response. And that message is then made up of lots of, uh, lots of different frames, which are going to uh, have different headers and datas uh, encapsulating that. And so the way the multiplexing works from a stream level is that TCP connection. The frames can then interleave with each other and reassemble at the end by using the stream ID to identify which stream sent that data. So on the graph here, you can see stream one sending data. Uh, stream three headers, stream three data, stream one data. It's all interleaved with each other and then reassembled at the end because uh, the stream ID is kept um, within that data. And there's a few more frame types than that 
in H2. These are some of the, I'd probably say the most important ones uh, to remember when, when looking at H2. So the data, the headers, and in addition to that, two of the, the more common ones are the priority. So the priority allows the stream to set a priority, which I'll get to shortly. Uh, push promise is used for server push. So for those familiar with H2, um, that's, that's what that one's doing there. Uh, could I just have a show of hands? Who has heard of H2 before, but is quite new to understanding H2? Great. And who has heard of H2? They've actually worked with H2. They've got quite a bit of experience with H2. Cool. And who didn't raise their hand then? OK. <laughs> OK, perfect. So header compression. So a really nice feature of H2 is the way it compresses headers. And it uses a compression, uh, compression mechanism called HPAC. And so the way HPAC works is it removes all the verbose header characters um, from the headers that are sent between, from, between the client and the server. Um, and the way that it's so verbose, it, yeah, it removes all, all of the repeat characters. So it, it only sends uh, certain header characters once, and then once it's sent it once, it, won't, it doesn't need to send it again. And the way that it, it achieves that is that there's uh, two, two tables, one, two on the server, two on the client, and the, the, there's a dynamic table which records all of the header information that's already been passed from the server to the client, and then the client to the server. And then instead of repeating that same header text again, it just uses the table reference as a reference, and it passes the reference instead. So then the browser can look up, oh, the server wanted to pass me this bit of header information because it's already referenced. There's also a static table as well, which contains a list of the most common headers, um, some of the most common headers that are generally used, general headers, which again can be referenced. And it's, it's really powerful. So it tends to achieve about 85% in terms of compression, HPAC. And in 1.1, 1 .1, uh, gzip and deflate are the standard compression mechanisms, me mechanisms that are used. And the reason that they weren't used was because with Speedy, there was a, a hack on the deflate uh, compression mechanism, which uh, I think it was called Crime. And so uh, it now enabled hackers to backwards engineer the data and uncover the data within HTTPS. So, that's why HPAC was chosen, a security preference, but it also has turned out to be really, really good and very, very good at compressing. <clears throat> so server push. Who's heard of server push on H2? Cool. Lots of people. So um, server push, um, a very powerful feature. It allows the server to uh, push data um, so to push objects before they're requested from the client. So the client's request might come in for that first HTML, and the server, if it's an H2 server and it's then intelligent, it's going to recognize that that HTML, typically these uh, style sheets are important for that above-the-fold rendering, that first rendering of the content, and these JavaScript files may be, some images, and it's going to push them to the client early. It's going to push them to the client straight away. And what that does is it makes, it fully utilizes the client's available bandwidth. So if the client has a good amount of bandwidth and the HTML is only taking up part of that bandwidth, then pushing these additional objects are going to max out that bandwidth. And so when the client finally does download that HTML, it's going to have these objects stored, um, the client's going to have these objects stored in their cache already. So when the browser starts to parse that HTML, it's immediately going to be able to start using those objects and start rendering the screen quicker. Um, it doesn't have to wait for the client to download the HTML, parse it, and then request those objects when it um, has it. The client's already going to have it. And server push um, really helps that first render. It's also so on the uh, right-hand side. Uh, so. Um, it's pushing the style sheet before the HTML. So server push is also good for any HTML that does some server-side rendering. Um, sorry, server-side processing first. So any HTML that's going off to the database or it's doing some server-side processing, to send in that time to first byte where there's no data being sent across the wire, to push the style sheets first, push the images first, 
And then when the HTML is finally ready to then deliver it, and then the client already has a lot of objects cached, it's going to be quicker, the speed's going to be faster. And server push has been proven to speed up rendering times by up to 20 to 50%. And it's actually turned on by default. So uh, most, most um, major browsers um, uh, allow server push uh, to be turned on, um, but it can be turned off. And the reason some clients might want to turn off server push is if they're using bandwidth restricted devices. So if they're using a mobile phone and they have a data allowance, that client might not want objects being pushed to it um, without requesting it. So it can be disabled, which is a nice feature, um, but it's turned on in general. So implementing server push, uh, everyone should probably be using, um, will we'll be making use of it. And it's considered better than inlining. Um, so for those of you who remember inlining, and it's still something that we do do to this day with 1.1, uh, inlining the, the style sheets and the JavaScript into the HTML. So it's, al it's already there. And then the client then doesn't have to then request those style sheets and JavaScript file after receiving the HTML. It's already within that page. Um, was faster. But server push is even faster because those objects can then be cached. So within lining, that code could not be cached. Uh, but because the objects will be separate and pushed up from the client to the server, then those objects can actually be cached. And so it's good for those subsequent page visits and repeat page, page visits. So prioritization and, and stream prioritization. The, with H2, the browser um, makes requests for the stream prioritization. So by prioritization, I'm referring to the amount of allocated bandwidth that each resource is getting when, it's being, when, it, when the browser is downloading that from the server. And the way that the browser weights those requests is it's, um, it, looks, or it does a weighting, and it looks at the dependencies as well. And the weighting is primarily, primarily based on the MIME type. So HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and images, that tends to be the, uh, the, the ranking. Uh, the order of most highest priority on most major browsers. So HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and images. And so that means that images would, will tend to get less, um, less bandwidth than, say, a style sheet would, where that would get more resource when being downloaded. That said, though, the browser makes these recommendations, but it ultimately the server has that ultimate choice, which is a little bit different to 1.1. So the browser might request that with the prioritization frame, but the server can choose to discard that and say it knows best and deliver other content. And this is, this is, this is a priority tree that the, the client would build. And this priority tree can dynamically change, and it works at runtime as well. So uh, if I follow through a few examples, so the implicit route is at the top, which is the star, and then on the left hand, uh, yeah, left-hand side, uh, just got A and B. So there's no dependencies for them. They, they have no parents. They all inherit off the implicit root. And so the weighting comes into play there. And the higher the weight, the more resource that is going to get. So four is, um, so B is going to get one third, one third of the resource that A will get. Um, on the second example in the middle, D is the parent of C. So D is going to consume the full resource um, before C. So it doesn't matter that C has a higher, a higher weight there. Um, D is still going to get that full resource um, first. And then example, uh, the final example on the right-hand side, uh, D um, receives the full resource before C. And C receives the full resource before A and B. And then B is then going to get one third of the resource that A gets. And the nice thing about it working dynamically and running at runtime is that if the user scrolls down the page, so from above the fold to below the fold, it's going to send a prioritization frame immediately and update. So the content at the top of the page is then going to be less important. So it's going to be deprioritized. And the content below the fold where the user's scrolling is then going to get more resource within the um, from, from the bandwidth. It's going to get more bandwidth allocated. Uh, and, and also, if the user switches from one tab to another tab, 
that again is going to have that same effect. Um, that, that tab is then going to get all of the resource, which I think is really cool. Um, so that's an example. And so the example of prioritization in action, uh, the example on the left is with, hopefully you can all see that. Can anyone see that? No, not really. Um, <clears throat> not the best font. So the example, let's see if I can zoom in. You can see that, right? Yeah. So the example on the left is without any priori prioritization set at all. And so everything is treated as equal. And the one on the right hand side is with prioritization enabled. And so if I, so you can see on the left here, some key images, uh, some key style sheets, which are downloading. And so 18.1 milliseconds and on the right 14.2, uh, 69.9 and on the right 22.7. So that's purely from turning prioritization on and the same throttling, uh, exactly the same um, set it, um, environment, and um, but the uh, the browser is weighting style sheets and JavaScript heavier, and so they get more resource um, over the images. Whereas on the other one, everything's equal, and so it's all allocated um, equally. So H two can actually be run over port eighty as clear text. It doesn't have to be TLS. It doesn't have to run over HTTPS, uh, but really it does. And, and the reason it does have to is really, um, is that the middleware on the internet, so the routers and the switches, um, they can get very nervous when they're seeing non-HTTP 1.1 protocol type traffic and then drop, uh, drop that traffic. And so because of the, the dropped traffic, um, the user then has a bad user experience. They're not able to, um, to, to get a good user experience. So for the most part, H2 does need to run over HTTPS so that that TLS tunnel can then bypass um, the, the, that middleware. And the middleware then can't inspect that traffic and then choose to drop it. It doesn't know what it is. It can't see the headers. So, for a good user experience, TLS does need to be enabled. And most modern browsers are going to require TLS to be enabled as well. <clears throat> so H2 can also, which is really nice, reduce weight on the back end. And by that, I mean the servers. So because uh, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of servers are set up to allocate one process per TCP connection. and with that one process per TCP connection, if you're using uh, H2, then that's just less resources needed to be um, used by the server. <clears throat> and compared to 1.1, where there's a, a lot of connections, a lot of TCP connections um, required. Having, that, having said that, though, if a website doesn't already have TLS enabled, um, that will add some slowdown. Uh, so uh, if the website already has HTTPS enabled, Great, H2 is a quick win, no, 100%. Um, um, if it doesn't and HTTPS does need to be enabled first, then <clears throat> um, it will still, H2 still will outweigh that advantage and still reduce weight off the back end um, generally. So, a client, um, so a common um, a journey that a client has is. They have a website that runs over 1.1. How can they then go about re-engineering that website for H2? What, what do they need to, to change? What do they need to do to achieve that? And <clears throat> one of the, the key things is to actually undo all of those hacks and those techniques that we did for 1.1 to then speed up for H2, because a lot of those best practices no longer help and actually have a negative net effect um, in H2. There's also um, other things that clients can do, like routing. So the, the website doesn't necessarily have to have two versions. Um, Akamai have some solutions, uh, one of them called Ion, which enables it to um, performance depending on which protocol the traffic, so the, the client's browser is running over, if it's running over 1.1 or 2, it will then um, optimize the website on the fly. Um, depending on the traffic that's been hosted over it. So the, uh, the, the website doesn't necessarily have to be re-engineered, um, but um, most of the time, that's, that's the process that the, the user goes through, depending on the amount of traffic that 
um, depending on the uh, the amount of traffic um, of the browsers that support HTTP2 would be coming from. So one of those best practices, as I alluded to earlier, is domain sharding, <clears throat> uh, serving content from multiple domains at the same time. And the reason why that doesn't isn't very helpful with H2 is that H2 um, H2 has uh, uh, one TCP connection per domain. So having domain sharding, have additional domains serving that content, is going to generate extra TCP connections, uh, extra load on the back end, extra round trips where the client has to establish that TCP connection for that domain. And in addition to that, header compression is much, much less effective on, um, on multiple TCP connections. So HPAC only has visibility of a per TCP connection that it sits across. So if there's one TCP connection, then HPAC will generate 85% header compression across that. And if it's multiple TCP connections, then those headers are still going to have to be sent for it to build up the table. So it's, it's working on each, each domain. Sorry, quick question. So it has a sure. per connection? Or, or <coughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, Concatenation. Um, <laughs> so the combining of CSS and JavaScript files. <clears throat> Again, that's that's not ideal for H2. It's probably not one of the worst things, but it's also it's certainly not the best either. Um, because having larger files, having the client to download a large JavaScript file and then process that large JavaScript file on, on their let's say, Android device is not an ideal situation. Android's not great with JavaScript, as we probably all know. Um, so it's much, it's much better to have smaller files, so smaller CSS files, smaller JavaScript files, so the client can get something quickly and then get something onto the screen quickly as well So um, to, for, for, the, for the browser to start rendering. In terms of increasing conversion rate and improving revenue, um, it's much better to have, from, so from the the, the, the array of run data that I have access to at the NCC group uh, and um, with our real user monitoring tool um, is, is been um, proven to show that a, a page that renders um, with some text but quickly, so it might have the logo, it might have some images, but there's some text, um, some image, some content that goes on the screen quickly and then the page then builds, um, the user is much more likely to stick around and convert than a page which is blank for a long period of time, and then it all appears all at once. So that one large style sheet downloads, and then it all appears all at once. So that's why concatenation and CSS spriting are much the same. Those larger images are, are not as effective, and it's better to, to actually um, sp um, split up those JavaScript files, which is great from a developer's point of view, because it makes the code more maintainable, and we don't have to run um, those uh, development uh, jobs before it's then released that then merge, concatenate the files together. So there are some kind of considerations for H2. And one of those is that low bandwidth devices, they tend to actually perform worse on H2. So um, for, for, for devices which don't have access to that much bandwidth, because they're they, they struggle to even download those six parallel connections in 1.1. Um, having additional stuff that that client then needs to download is just going to take more resource away from those important initial objects. So for above the fold rendering, there, there might be some HTML, a few style sheets and images, something that just the browser needs to display quickly. And so pushing everything all at once um, is only going to take away bandwidth away from those uh, important resources. So what that has a net effect of is that the page load actually becomes slower in H2. So fast dev devices, um, H2, the, the way the internet's going, we're having lots and lots of bandwidth, most people are on 4G anyway, uh, but there are some people out there that have low, low bandwidth devices. Um, sim similar, similarly, um, XP machines, they are not supported anymore. So IE um, on XP won't actually run H2 at all. And IE on XP, uh, it might not even, depending on how TLS is implemented, it might not even run HTTPS either. So 
if the, the fallback from H2 is to 1.1, um, that also might break um, so the, the user actually sees nothing. So it, it's not a quick win, 100%. Um, and what I would recommend and urge any client before embarking on a journey like H2 is to check their real user monitoring data first, their analytics data, to look at the segmentation, to look at how many of their users are running over low power devices, um, low bandwidth devices rather, um, how many users they have on XP um, that, that, that use XP. I'm sure there's not many, but um, that, that use IE over that. And there are going to be some websites that are more tailored towards the younger generation where they have the latest technology. And there are going to be other websites which have more of an older clientele that have more low powered, low bandwidth type devices. H2 can even help progressive web apps. So if it's the first load and the web service worker um, isn't primed with any client side cache, then downloading that first load of the uh, progressive web app over H2 is going to be faster. Um, um, so that, that's another uh, addition, additional bonus. Um, it will help with PWAs. And there's lots of CDN support already for H2. So Fastly, Akamai, um, and, and all the others, they all support um, H2. And <clears throat> there are certainly some considerations for, for CDNs in terms of H2. And, and one of those considerations is the CDNs like to, um, like to be able to inspect the headers. And so um, the, um, uploading the TLS certificate um, to the CDN will uh, enable the CDN to then terminate that connection and then to be able to inspect that data. Um, and that, I believe that's typically what is required from the, for the CDNs to work. <clears throat> so this isn't, so um, this goes up to Chrome 58 and the compatibility is, compatibility is only increasing. So we've got loads of browser compatibility for H2, um, loads and loads of support. And if for some bizarre reason, a client is using a browser that doesn't support H2, it just won't upgrade. So um, the, the, the server makes the decision to upgrade. It attempts to upgrade 1.1 to H2. And if the client browser doesn't accept it, then it will just serve the website over 1.1. There's no difference. <clears throat> so decided we're interested in H2 and then the consideration is, well, how do I serve it? What server should I use? What hosting should I use? And there's certainly a few questions to ask before selecting the correct H2 server for your needs. And a few of those questions are, does the server respect stream and connection flow? Does the server um, have a good sense of prioritization? Does it support dependencies and weights? How, how does it have that prioritization as well? Does the server support server push? And does the server have intelligent caching? There are certainly quite a few H2 choices out there. And these are just a few of the providers of H2 servers. And to list a couple, so Jetty is a, a Java web server. And what Jetty does, which is a very nice feature, is it, it does something called intelligent push. So the server will learn what files the client has. Um, <clears throat> so it does intelligent push. So it, it looks at the historical data of files which are requested um, from clients. And it looks at what dependencies those files have and what files are typically served to users when certain uh, requests are made. And then over time, it then learns what the users want, what, what's pushed to the users, and then it will auto push those files ahead of time. So it doesn't even require any development effort. It just learns on the fly. It learns what, um, it learns what users request, and it pushes that data. And so H2O server, that has a, a feature called client cache aware. And so that will only push files, that will only server push files, then it is sure that the client doesn't already have cached. So <clears throat> the, the, the issue potentially with server push is pushing content that the client might already have already. And so then that's wasted bandwidth, that's sending data and the client already has it. And so the way the H2O server achieves server push is by making use of cookies. And so storing the data in cookies and then only pushing data that it knows it hasn't got. Um, 
Cool, we've got time for a quick demo. So, let's have a look here. So, I've set up a quick demo, and this is a website which I built really, really quickly. So, it's just to demonstrate H2 and how, how easy it is to set up. So, I created a self signed TLS certificate and copied that. So, for those, um, so this is a Java application. And for and those of you who are interested in Java, uh, this is using Tomcat 9, JDK 8, and Servlet 4.0 specification, which is the requirements for Java to be able to support H2. And, and so I created a, a TLS uh, certificate and key first, which I uploaded to the Tomcat server. And then to then set this up, <clears throat> the server XML file here. It's then this was then commented out before. And then so just uncommenting that, which is just opening the connector port 8443. Oh, okay. Um, what do I do? Cool. Nice. <clears throat> so this is looking at connector port 8443. And then it's uh, just got a line of code to try and upgrade, upgrade the protocol. So if it sees that the client's browser will support it, then to upgrade to HTTP2. Um, anyone know how to do that on a Windows? What's that? Scroll. I'm going to scroll here. Uh, My trackpad. <laughs> nope. In IntelliJ, do um, Control Shift A and then Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> no, Control Shift uh, A, it'll bring up the prompt. <coughs> then someone will be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now type Zoom. Love it. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> How do I use it? <laughs> <laughs> it's user friendly, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's fine. Uh, anyone that's interested in the code, um, just come and grab me um, while we're uh, while pizza's around, and I'll show you the code. <clears throat> it might take ages otherwise. So I've, I've uncommented eight four four three, and uploaded the certificates, and then I've got a basic servlet, which is my server side code, <clears throat> which is using the push builder class. And um, so I've created a new push push builder object. <clears throat> And then I'm pushing four, uh, four files here. So bootstrap theme.css, style CSS, um, and these other ones here. So if I run that, it's running already. Cool. So let's put this over um, port 443. <coughs> That's okay. Yeah. That's reassuring. Got to like got to love a live demo. So let's open up developer tools, see what's going on. Network, so yep, so it's going to establish the H2 connection, <clears throat> which we can see it pulling in here. 
So this is just a page with some text, and I think it should have some images as well down the bottom. Uh, let's run that again, actually, but throttle it. So this is a broadband, a, a throttle broadband connection, five meg download, four meg upload. Um, let's refresh. Cool. So <clears throat> you can see here, so I pushed four, four objects and hovering over. So in, um, first of all, in Chrome DevTools, I can see the protocol level here. So I can see it's all like running over H2. That's not. Um, sometimes it's not turned on by default, and so just right-clicking on that tab enables me to open that up. And in the waterfall, I can see um, <clears throat> I can see those pushed objects. So I can see when the uh, the browser started receiving the push, and then I can see how long it spent reading the push as well. And the objects that I didn't push is is very apparent um, that they they've taken longer to download on that download on that throttle connection because there's no lag, um, and that's one of the great benefits of, of server push. <clears throat> and in Java, that's making use of the push builder Java object class. No. <laughs> please, please, no. <clears throat> um, uh, cool. So, Finally, what, what does the future hold? And I clearly don't know. Um, otherwise, um, I would play the lottery or something. But what I would predict is that there's going to be more frequent updates than we've had in the past of HTTP. I can't imagine it's going to take another 18 years for the next version of HTTP to be released. I hope not. Um, Google apparently are working on a project called Quick. Um, which is looking at the premise of uh, serving UDP traffic over HTTP2. And that could well be the, um, the new HTTP3, possibly. So um, yeah, that, that, was, that was my uh, introduction into HTTP2. Uh, let's keep this conversation going. Um, we're all in web performance together, this thing. We all like to make websites faster. Um, so I'm on Twitter at the moment. Uh, I've just, just joined, so twitter.com, King Web String. Um, add me up. I'll, I'll be adding free content up there, uh, articles. Um, you can also send me any questions, and I'll try my best to, to respond to them in a timely, timely fashion. Um, I just want to quick say, say a quick thank you to Perry as well um, for all his time and effort in organizing these events. Uh, I can imagine it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort to do that. So uh, thank you, Perry. If we could have a round of applause for Perry for just putting this together. <laughs> Um, yeah, and thank you all for your time today. And uh, let's go and drink some beer and eat some pizza. Hang on, we'll have some questions first. <laughs> OK, yeah, thanks very much for that. Uh, that was a great talk. Some uh, interesting stuff there. The, anyone got any, any questions? Right, well, like, keep your hands up, and then I can just kind of like place where you're going to be. Right, I'll, I'll come to you soon. A uh, question on uh, streams and the visibility <coughs> of them uh, client side. Yeah. Is it uh, possible for you to tag a stream and to receive that info uh, client side? To use like uh, the streams as uh, channels for for traffic that that you want to pass through, kind of like uh, web sockets. Um, I don't think so. No, we, we're getting some shakings of the head from Andy Davies. So you mentioned domain sharding isn't a good idea anymore. Yeah. But are there still benefits for like cookieless subdomains for static assets? So you're not serving your cookies, or is it is it still worth just having one domain for all your assets? Um, what what was the benefit? I didn't catch. So. That. Traditionally, you can have multiple domains uh, and ones for static assets that don't require cookies. You can serve your assets without cookies, and then the header wouldn't contain those cookies. Yeah. But I wonder if header compression for H2 sort of means you don't have to have separate domains anymore. Um, yes. Um. <laughs> so that, that, you, you answered the question. It sounds like it. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, H HPAC will, will compress that away from you if, because of the dynamic table. So you, you'll only ever send the cookie payload unless the cookie payload changes and therefore the value will change. Um, Andy. You'll only ever send Andy. the cookie payload once, cookie which will then get assigned to an ID in the dynamic table. And then for all other subsequent requests, <laughs> only the ID will be sent and not the cookie payload. So yes, H H you, you answered it, HPAC will compress away that problem. If I understood it properly, uh, you said that uh, uh, via scrolling, the user is able, actually the browser is able to change the priority of the, the resources fetched. Yep. Uh, I was wondering if you can spend some words about that. Uh, so how the deal between the browser and the servers happened and uh, yeah, what is the, the, the dynamic behind? Yeah, so the client will send a prioritization frame um, on, on an update. So when, um, when, when that event is picked up that the scroll is moving and then so other objects are becoming visible within the page. Um, it's then going to send a reprioritization. How that actually works and how the server interprets it. Um, again, the server makes the ultimate decision. So the, the client's browser, and every browser is different, but the client's browser can request a reprioritization of the content, but then the, it's up to the server to then decide whether it wants to adhere to that or whether it still wants to do its own thing instead. Any idea about the browser coverage? Um, we, I don't understand. Um, the, the prioritization frame, most modern browsers will support H2 prioritization frame. Uh, all modern browsers, I think, major ones. So that, that's the really big caveat at the moment is that Firefox currently the only people that are prioritizing and they're not prioritizing properly. So all of the servers that um, it was referenced on the screen have implemented priority properly. Um, including, like, the weird thing is that even Chrome themselves and Google were the first implementers and actually specced prior the priority frame, but none of them have implemented. So not, currently, Firefox is the only browser and then really not doing it that well. Um, the server implementation is, is there. Um, but, like, the dream is, as was said, that, like, we can scroll and we'll change, but that's not happening at all in production <laughs> yet. Um, Sadly. What's up? Okay. Is that a comment on that point? Well, it's a separate question. I'll come to you in a second. Sure. Uh, two quick questions. Um, you can turn off and on server push. What is it like a best practice for server push for CDNs? Because obviously you want to use the CDN to save your bandwidth, not push more stuff to the CDN that you don't need. Yeah. Um, I think the two chaps that work at CDN is probably best place to answer that question. <laughs> OK, I'll ask me. Um, and the second, what other tooling is there? I know you've got the dev tools. Are there any like command line tools or any other sort of libraries and things for like, I'm a sysapp, yeah. um, so I'm not a front end, um, but for inspecting um, H2 and all that yeah. kind of stuff? Uh, typically Wireshark, I think, is the, the most common one to yep. use. So you, so you use a plug in. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Cheers. Yeah, exactly that. That's yeah. it. Um, Latest versions of curl are now compiling H2 in. And so it, previously it was a flag, but now you can just do it as long as you've got a latest. And the other one is N NG HTTP2, which you can homebrew install if you're a Mac user, and that lets you inspect. <laughs> I'm not going to let Andy have it. Uh, that lets you actually inspect the frames as well. And so you, yeah. Which uh, two CDNs do you have in there? Fastly and Akamai. Fastly and Akamai. Um, oh, I'll let you guess. No. I, I must say that we are, we are friends and we are both sponsors of the meetup. So it's, it's friendly. Um, there's, no, there's no wars here. <laughs> if you actually want to look at what's going on over uh, HTTP2, one of the things to do is look at the net log in Chrome because um, that will give you a good indication of what's going on from a frame point of view. Rebecca Murphy, who is R. Murphy on GitHub, I believe. I can't quite remember. Um, wrote a utility where you can copy and paste the stuff out of NetLog and use a node utility and it will plot sort of a waterfall to show you um, what frames are coming down from what request when. It's a bit rough and ready, um, but it gives you a good view of what's going on.
net internals. Yes, you're quite right. Net log is the uh, yeah, Chrome colon slash slash net internals. And you can see all that's going on at the network level, more than you'll ever want. So for, for sites that still have to support HTTP 1.1, uh, how do you reconcile 1.1 best practices with H2 best practices, or do you just let 1.1 be slow? Yeah. Um, so good question, that one. It, it comes down to well, the, the real user data. So I did mention that there are ways to load balance depending on and to optimize on the fly. There are potential solutions out there. So. Um, the optimize based on the protocol that's being sent. So if it's 1.1 or if it's H2, and to go off their different routes and then to optimize on the fly, uh, that, that's probably a good good starting place to look at that. Um, having a neutral type website that's fairly good on both possibly is a good way to look at it as well. I don't know. Yeah. Response to that. And it's also a response to the domain sharding question earlier on, which is one of my strongest advice in that situation is not to consolidate your domains. Actually, so I forgot to mention this in your question, um, which is that uh, H2, which wasn't mentioned in the presentation, has a, uh, a feature called coalescing, which is domain coalescing, mm -hmm. which means that if the domain is shared, um, the authority of the domain is shared by the same, it resolves to the same IP address browsers will coalesce that connection, i.e. they will not create a secondary TCP connection because it thinks it's a different destination because the authority has actually spec'd it, well, state, stated that I actually own both of these domains. So you can still, in a H1 world, have the benefits of domain sharding because it will actually con create uh, concurrent connections, but in a H2 world, still get the benefit of a shared H2 connection. So my advice at the moment is to not preemptively uh, uh, sync, uh, get rid of your domain sharding if you still have to have a very large proportion of users on each one. Is, is that in terms of literally resolving the domains to the same IP or is that kind of, let's say, the, the actual main part of the domain rather than the subdomain, as it were? They are separate. Yeah. But so the shards have to resolve, resolve to the same IP, and they have to be covered by the same certificate, which is resolving to the same IP is possible, but sometimes it's hard in the global load balancing world. And because of that, that Andy just mentioned, <laughs> uh, there's a very long discussion currently in the H2 working group about uh, what's going to be known as the authority frame, um, which allows a server, regardless of the cert or the IP, to well, no, sorry, there are going to be some security issues there, but uh, the, basically the, the, the server can dictate that I am authoritative of these domains as long as they match across certain wildcard asserts to solve that problem. Okay. Cool. Right, there was one down the back here. Um, you mentioned uh, concatenation potentially being an anti-pattern now going forward, yep. um, but is there still value in it if you have <coughs> like our website, a shitload of requests. Um, and what are the requests primarily? Are they first party, third party? Uh, well, both, but mostly third party. OK. And so the, the, the render for that first paint, that above the fold paint, um, how many objects, how many requests typically take a first above the fold paint? Yeah, so I mean, you could do that in a small number of requests. Um, but I guess to render the entire page and make it functional, uh, it's whether you use, you know, you concatenate all your files or whether you kind of split them up. Um, testing. I, I think really every website is different. It's going to come down to testing. So using web page tests or as an NCC group employee, I'd recommend Performance Analyzer, <laughs> our offering, uh, to, then, to then test uh, in a staging-based environment to, to see which one's faster. Um, Someone, uh, someone else on this side, you were responding to that, or? Right, okay, I'm just this. If you're concatenating your third party scripts, can't you proxy them over an HQ server? Uh, 
<laughs> you can do really cool things if you proxy your third parties through your H2 server because they can coalesce the connection and you can push critical third parties before the rest of your first party content if they're A-B testing or something that's going to manipulate the DOM before it's rendered. Just putting it out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, my question is basically a follow-up to the CDN question that was asked before. So I assume for H2 to work on a CDN, like the CDN has to cast the actual rendered template and then the server, that, like the casting server partners or whatever is implementing on the CDN layer makes the decision as in to what push her to push the, to the client, right? Or else? Um, so for the people that work at CDNs? It depends on the CDN implementation. So uh, you, you, you quite rightly mentioned uh, Eon, okay. Akamai's okay. solution, which will deterministically do that based on machine learning and what is observed beforehand and it will choose fish but depending on your CDN implementation you can so what wasn't mentioned with push is that um, currently the only way that most servers have um, chosen as the way for an author ie yourself to dictate to a proxy such as a CDN what resources should be pushed is via a link header with the relation attribute of push. Um, and now, the, I personally find that's, that you, you've, there's actually a problem with that, which is that the indication of that is too late, and so you're not benefiting on the idle time on the connection. So if you imagine a, the, a request comes in, it's not cached, it has to go to the origin server, the origin server responds with a link header of push, and you start pushing that resource. But at that time, you've also got the response of the origin. So you're actually going to be um, uh, sending the wrong bytes down the wire at the time for your HTML versus your CSS. So uh, people, including Fastly and Akamai, are starting to think about ways of how you can decouple the resources that you think should be pushed for uh, an object that is cached. Um, the logic for that from the object itself, because that is too late being on the link header. And that's the biggest problem with fish. So uh, another way to look at this is a colleague of mine called Kazuo, who wrote H2O, which is one of the service references there, is got a working draft in the IETF at the moment for a new HTTP status code called uh, 103, uh, which is early hints. And so, which decouples the, uh, signification or so, uh, what's the word i'm looking for the semantics of uh, i want to push these resources and they are tied to this uh, from the, the processing side of that so you can flush early a 103 response whilst you're still computing the actual response to the html and all that response is it doesn't have a body it just contains headers of link preload headers saying you will need all of these resources i am giving you an early hint of all of these resources and the CDN, sorry, to tie us back into CDNs, will also be able to cache that. And whenever a request comes in for index.html, it knows that as well as the actual 200, final 200 response, it's also got a 103 response. And so whilst it's processing or finding out whether that's a cache hit or a miss, it can flush down the push resources. So we're not there and going, and as we said here, like there's the future um, push basically is very much in its infancy. It's basically broken in most browsers. And the uh, author implementation and server implementations, you're normally doing it too late in the connection state. So we need things such as Cache Digest, which H2O is implemented, which was referenced today, and the 103 status code to solve that. Because the, even if you do push the resources, the client still might have that cached. And so you've actually wasted bandwidth um, for other resources. And so the, the final specification is something called Cache Digest, which is a way, so H, as, as mentioned, H2O is the only people that have done this yet, which is a, a way of the clients telling the server, this is what I have in the cache for this authoritative domain. Um, and so the way H2O did it as a prototype was using a cookie and uses a hashed balloon filter of that, sending it as a cookie. But we want to spec it as a H2, uh, sorry, a HTTP2 frame that says here are the things. But there's loads of security concerns. But push at the moment, again, I don't actually 
advocate people using unless you really know what you're doing or you know the clients that you're targeting. And I'm very happy to talk to people at length, Jinkies, um, about that. Does that answer the question? <laughs> okay, any more for any more? Great. Oh, no? Good. Okay, well, one more. Great big thanks to for Rob for putting that presentation together. So a nice round of applause for Rob. Thank you. Yeah, and just a quick reminder on the things that we've got coming up. So meet up at the start of October, another one towards the end of October, one at the start of November, and then another one in early December. So there's a lot coming from the group. So keep your eyes peeled on the um, on Twitter and on email and uh, and hope to see you all here again soon. And um, Peter should be turning up in a few minutes. It's quite nice to actually finish five minutes before they do so I can actually turn the stream off and all those kind of things and uh, maybe actually join you a little bit more calmly for a beer in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. But thank you very much for coming. Hope you stay around for the chat and uh, see you next month.